some of you folks might remember a few years ago in October 2013, healthcare.gov launched and it was crushed under the load. So of course that's good news, right? People actually want this service, they need this. But uh, healthcare reform was in danger of failing because of a website. Does that seem right to you? I mean, think about all the, the talent and success in the US tech sector and the United States government couldn't get a website up. So a month later, they finally got the sense to open the doors to industry experts that could come in and lead the recovery effort so that by the end of the following April, not only had they enrolled their revised target of six million people, or their original target of seven, but cumulatively they had eight million people enrolled in healthcare. So this website recovery was a huge success thanks to a dramatic change in the government tech culture, and it was a triumph for DevOps principles. You had a small integrated team that could come in and turn around a troubled project that was years and hundreds of millions of dollars in the making. It's because the technology actually was never the problem. It was the contracting culture. Managing those waterfall-style waterfall contracts took priority, and people just kind of assumed, oh yeah, the software is going to be good. It'll have quality. So the key to the story here was that once the administration decided it wanted to fix the real problem instead of adhering to decades worth of you know, contracting and procurement conventional wisdom, they actually fixed the real problem. But the big question then is, what's next? How do you, I, how did this happen in the first place? So how can you keep it from happening again? And how can the momentum from this recovery effort help to reform development culture throughout the government? And you know, what am I doing here talking about this? How did I get looped in? So I had left Google and the tech industry in September 2011. I thought, that's it, I'm done. I went back to music school. I went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston. But then I got this curious email from a, uh, old colleague through LinkedIn, and he wrote me something that went like this. As you may or may, or may not be aware, I helped late last year with the healthcare.gov website rescue. It's going to take a while before the government gets good at software development and testing, and they're going to need a culture change. The White House gets it now that fundamental change is needed in how they create and test software, and more importantly, that change imposed top-down is likely to fail. Again, no pressure. I respect your desire <clears throat> to focus on other things. But there's this whole your country needs you thing. So I figured I'd just put that out there for you to think about. And I don't think he realized I <clears throat> excuse me, grew up in a military town. So he had just basically slammed my big red button. Um, I dropped out of school. I joined the government in November 2014. And I just left this past March. But to understand why Jason recruited me, let's go back in time to when I joined Google in 2005. So, of course, the company was already hugely successful. Everybody could see it. Everybody wanted to work there. And it was as famous for its stimulating work environment as it was for its products. I mean, it was like a big grad school-like atmosphere. And, you know, we had our 20% time to, you know, innovate and try new things. And, of course, there was plenty of food. So... I think right after I joined, I gained like 30 pounds off of chocolate cover espresso beans that were in one of these bulk things. Like I just kept going back to the trough. It was ugly. Um, but with all this freedom in food, actually did come a great deal of responsibility. I mean, not just to our users and customers, to one another. It was baked into the development culture very early that people were expected as one of their first tasks to pass what was called a readability review. You had to write a bit of code and get it reviewed by somebody that made sure that you were doing things in line with the style guide for that language so that you knew not just the formatting rules but the idioms. And this enabled people to actually quickly understand code all throughout our single shared repository. And of course that helped people um, collaborate, move from project to project, and find and fix bugs. I mean, I consider it a career achievement I actually found in identified a legitimate bug in Bigtable once. I was like, woo. Um, so we are also expected to send all of our production code changes out for review, and we are expected to review code for others as one of our highest priority tasks. And not only not, that not only kept the code at a pretty high quality level, 
but it created the opportunity for discussion around each change. And it, you know, ideally, that meant that knowledge about a particular feature or what have you wasn't limited to one person's brain. And then this repository of discussion, people could mine it later for history if they needed to revisit that code and that decision. And also enable people to hone their skills. They would share like insights, things they learned, tips and tricks. We are expected to participate in the interviewing pool, provide clear, thoughtful, meaning, meaningful feedback on candidates. Of course, we actually did have a lot of internal documentation, had a huge wiki for a number of years. It was eventually replaced by Google Sites. And there was like this early culture of doing design docs where you, know, you basically talk about the pros and cons of the thing you want to build before people um, go forward with it. And that became a less prominent practice, but it was still alive and well in a lot of other forums. But the bottom line was communicate with people, collaborate, and support one another across the company in order to improve our operations and improve the capabilities, expand the capabilities of our products. So basically, we had a responsibility to help one another improve our code, our products, our company, and ultimately ourselves. And so on the whole, things were working pretty well for Google. Had to be doing something right, a lot of ways it was. But there was a side no one outside the company could really see or appreciate. We were potentially in danger of collapsing under the weight of our own success. Because as you can imagine, as the company grew, as more people came in, writing more code, more features, more products, the complexity and everything just exploded. And even though Google did the best it could to hire the best people it could find and to support them, there was ultimately never going to be any amount of brainy heroics that was going to overcome the challenges of sheer scale. So the company was risking holding itself back slowing itself down as the fear of change and all the things that might go wrong threatened to stifle courage and innovation, which would lead to missed opportunities, empire building, mediocrity, and ultimately irrelevance. And there is no project more visibly susceptible to these forces than the Google web server, or what we call, <clears throat> excuse me, what we call GWIS for short. Um, so this is the team that's responsible for Google.com homepage. And I wasn't a member of that team, but I worked very, very closely with some of the folks, as we'll see. And the thing is, back in 2004, 2005, GWIS was not a glamour assignment. It was basically a dumping ground for all these different changes that people had, for features they wanted to ship. And they're on different teams telling GWIS, integrate this, integrate that. Things were a mess. And just imagine if you break Google.com or allow it to be broken. I mean, the search results might not be as good as they could be. They might suck. Uh, they might come back too slow. And so all of these thousands of queries per second add up pretty quickly to thousands of broken promises. And you're talking about losing not only revenue in that case, but trust. At the same time, though, like I said, you know, a lot of people thought, hey, things are great. Everything's working. We're doing all these other things that are great. Um, and of course, there was a lot of press you know, inflating egos. People probably believe the hype a little bit, and then you had like the frauds like me that somehow slipped through the system, and we were just, you know, sweating bullets that one day we were gonna get found out and kicked out of the company. Um, most people at the time, though, actually, they didn't know how to write testable code, and I'll hammer on that in a minute. And the development tools we were using at the time, they were really breaking down under the load. And when I say friction here, I mean it in a very physical sense. Things just took time. But the biggest obstacle to convincing people that testing was a valuable practice, by far, was you're trying to convince people the value of preventing problems rather than just addressing them as they arise. So we can, and I have, pointed to notable examples where automated testing discipline may have led to the prevention of some pretty high-profile bugs, but people kind of underestimate the tendency of these things happening to them, especially when the core of their value system depends entirely on objective measurements. And certainly, Google's famous for data-driven decision-making. It's served the company very well. Its customers' society has benefited. 
but it did make it extremely difficult to convince people that investing in learning how to do better testing was going to be worth their time. And we could not really blame them because, again, people back then, especially all the MIT and Stanford grads they kept scooping up, they had no experience with testing outside the slowness and brittleness of the status quo. And they were always under delivery pressure. You know, ship something that you could show your grandma. Uh, so given, given our inability to communicate using this language of data, they really couldn't understand why we thought it was so important. And we couldn't blame them for not trying to do any testing when they couldn't afford the time to learn how to do it. So we had to find other ways around the problem. And before I get into the specifics, I want to talk a little bit in the abstract about how cultures change in general. One thing for sure, it doesn't happen like this, because there's nothing worse than Cartman with authorita, which basically means no matter how good an idea, if you try to shove it down from the top, people are likely going to fight it, and it's not going to work. Fortunately for us at Google at the time, so many of our executives had learned this lesson before at Microsoft, Novell, Sun, Digital, Bell Labs. But it also doesn't change like this. There's no rock star guru ninja that's going to come in and fix all your problems for you. In fact, I fight against people using these words because I think they ascribe a certain type of power to other human beings that's supposed to be beyond the reach of us mere mortals. And I believe that it's wasteful at best and dangerous at worst to assume that change is only possible through the power, the magic, the charisma of a selected few. Now, I'm not anti-power and mythology. I actually think they're very useful tools. You just have to be very careful about what you're doing with them and how you cultivate them. And a useful mythology is going to be repeatable to some extent. In other words, it provides a model. I mean, we can never say, Google did this, we're going to do exactly that, and it's going to work. Different situations, products, people, dynamics. But I think the most important part when we tell these stories is the principles from which all of these processes and technologies emerge. And kind of the, the core principle driving the story I want to tell today is that organizations should be serving the people in them, not the other way around. They shouldn't just be coercing people to just follow orders. In order for that to happen, people need to know what the right thing to do is, and they need to know how to actually do it. So back in 2005, relatively few people, especially in Google, but throughout much of the industry, nobody really had that much experience with automated testing yet, or had any experience, you know, not just knowing how to do it, but why it was important. And the tools were getting slower and slower. We had to make the right thing to do the easy thing to do. So let's get into the specifics. Why was the right thing so hard to do back in Google in 2005? Well. Back then, as I mentioned, testing wasn't as big a thing. It was picking up a m momentum, clearly, but it wasn't quite the kind of thing that a lot of people take for granted these days. And internally, <laughs> somehow the term unit test was applied to anything that ran in five minutes or less. And otherwise, it was a regression. That's, that's what you do. That's how it was expressed in our build language, unit test, regression test. And like I said, the tools, they were getting slower with every new developer, every new project, every new line of code. And again, back then, everything was on your workstation, too. And one of the most common reasons people said, oh, this is why I don't write tests, they said, my code's too hard to test. I mean, these people figured out how to scale web search and other applications to an entire planet, and they say they can't figure out automated testing. Does that sound right to you? What they were really saying is they just don't know how to do it, which I just got out of Stanford and I joined Google. I know everything. I'm not going to admit that. They certainly don't teach testable design in most graduate courses. Most folks had never been on a really good project or a really bad one. <laughs> and on top of that, there were few good examples to follow. 
So absent this knowledge and experience, everybody just kind of felt like Jon Snow when it came to testing. Like they knew nothing. They wouldn't admit it, but they didn't. What they were really saying when they came up with the I don't have time to test excuse is, it takes forever to do anything, and the tests that we have take too long, and I gotta deliver some stuff. <sighs> These excuses, they were valid, but they contributed to a company culture that was actively hostile to the adoption of automated testing. And there are a few of us, I'm about to introduce, that we felt the culture had to change for the good of the company, our products, our customers, and ultimately for society. But merely just arguing people down, that wasn't gonna be a productive path. So the things they were complaining about signaled real problems, but business as usual would not suffice. So we had to stand up, take a stand, which is difficult in any organizational culture to go against the grain, but the thing is, just because a piece of the culture is broken doesn't mean that the rest of it is. So by applying the cultural tools at your disposal effectively, you can eventually reach a point where you can make the right thing the easy thing to do. And despite the limitations and challenges that we faced, there were a lot of advantages to the fact that, hey, we were at Google. We had access to information like crazy and all kinds of tools to help us discover it. We were empowered to develop and pursue a vision and to collaborate with like-minded folks in pursuit of that vision. And we ended up adhering to a common model as well that uh, Jeffrey Moore described in his book, Crossing the Chasm. He was describing you know, adoption of new tech products in general, but certainly adoption of any practice follows the same pattern. And if you're not familiar with it, over on the left, uh, the thin end of the wedge, are these two groups called the um, innovators, the really bleeding edge people, and the early adopters. And I lump them together and I call them instigators. That's where my title comes from, self-applied. Um, the idea is like, these are like the, the like-minded seekers of change. They, they know things can be better and they want to make it happen. But they have to cross this chasm to the early majority in the blue here. And the early majority is actually very open to new things, new, new ideas and change, but they're not the expert. They need solutions that are accessible, they can take and they can just start using. The late majority, the purple, they're, you know, they, they'll just do whatever everybody else is doing. And the, the laggards over here, they're useless, just forget about them. Um, but the key is you gotta get the right messaging to the right people in the right order. And crossing that chasm in between the instigators and the early majority is what will make or break your initiative. And we'll see, I've plugged in a little bridge here and I'm gonna illustrate that in a few slides. But first, let's go back to the GWIS example. So the tech lead of GWIS, a guy named Bart Matarata, he thought automated testing would go a long way to solving GWIS's problems with complexity and fragility. So the team took a hard line. No more changes would be accepted into GWIS without accompanying automated tests. And so they set up a continuous build and they religiously kept it passing. They set up coverage monitoring. They made sure it was up and to the right over time. And they instituted a policy and wrote some testing guides. And they made sure that all contributors, both within the team and from other teams, adhered to those policies and practices. And <clears throat> despite the initial unpopularity of this hard stand, the GWIS team held firm and they did eventually turn a corner. They became one of the most productive teams in the company. They were integrating all these different changes from all these other players and they were still keep keeping up a really brisk release schedule. And as the team grew, new people were productive very, very quickly because of all the automated tests and the resulting good, healthy code that people could just dive in and contribute. So ultimately, this radical policy enabled the Google.com homepage to very rapidly expand its capabilities and thrive in an incredibly fast-moving and competitive technology landscape. But, yeah, I mean, it goes without saying, GWIS is an example. This is what automated testing can do and why it's good. But it actually, in the context of larger Google, it was still a pretty small team and a large and growing company. 
So we had to take its message, its principles, its model, and kind of amplify this somehow and build that bridge across the chasm. So Bart partnered up with a fellow named Nick Wasecki and started what I proudly uh, remember as the testing grouplet. Um, and a grouplet basically was, hey, we're a group of people that have 20% time. We're gonna basically create our own team and try to solve a problem for the entire company. And eventually, I you know, was handed the torch. I led this group after Bart and Nick at some point. And we had very little budget, zero authorita, but we had so much latitude to try creative solutions to the problems we were facing. And we could rely on the GWIS experience as our foundational model. So one of the first things we did is we worked with NGDU. This was a fully staffed in-house training organization and we helped them develop uh, these training materials called code labs. And then based on those code labs, we produced this uh, lecture and lab session for new hires, because when you get hired, NGDU walks you through like a two-week session of classes. And they also helped us coordinate and promote tech talks, both from people within the company and people that we wanted to invite from outside. We ended up working really, really closely with our internal tools teams as well, and eventually, as we'll see, unleashed this tool kit or tool chain that essentially took away the I don't have time to test excuse. But our biggest breakthrough, I think, by far, testing on the toilet. If you haven't heard of it, it's been running for 10 years, still running. Um, it's a weekly newsletter we put up in just about every bathroom throughout the company. I still say we, isn't that strange? Um, and uh, the idea is we would use this medium to gradually increase awareness of testing and people's you know, sophistication level of comfort with it. And so I picked this particular episode. You can't read it here, but if you, down, you know, look at the slides, you could blow it up. But I, I picked it not just because I did happen to write it, but um, I accidentally also encapsulated two other hugely important testing group initiatives. The first was test certified. So this was a roadmap to better testing practices that we based on the GWIS model. And it did two important things. It, it hacked our culture because it was comprised of, you know, installing tools that allowed you to measure things. And then the tasks themselves added up to levels. And then when you were at a certain level, you could see it on this app, the test certified ladder, and compare where you were. And then the other thing is that it got people over that big, scary psychological obstacle of, yeah, I want to do better, but where do I start? And it, when a team agreed to participate in the program, we also found mentors, volunteers that would, you know, encourage and advise the team on things that they wanted to do. And these mentors would also validate the progress as they climbed the ladder. The ladder. And one of the things we figured out in about mid-2007 is, hey, this is a great mission. Let's get the whole company to test certified level three by the end of 2009. And... Um, we didn't care if anybody was actually in the test certified program. We just wanted them operating as though they were. So the other program that is encapsulated in this is the test mercenaries, which I also became a member of. Um, and we were like hands-on internal consultants. We would join teams, work on their project for a few months, and we would be using all the things that we talked about in testing on the toilet, the tools, the techniques. We would be doing that with side by side with the team on their own code, and um, <clears throat> we would use test certified as sort of like a, you know, a guide and a goal for our progress. And then on top of that, especially the, the tight integration loop between the mercenaries and the tools teams led to this tool suite that changed everything and took away the I don't have time to test excuse. And one of my favorite things that we also did, we ordered these, we organized uh, several of these big company-wide events, traditionally called fix-its, where you put a call out to the whole company to say, let's spend this day fixing something. And it wasn't, you know, no uh, permission was sought, no approval was granted, we just did it. And we could get people to focus on doing important but not urgent things like 
writing tests for uncovered code, fixing, you know, broken, flaky tests, making progress up the test certified ladder. And then we found out it was an incredibly powerful way of rolling out tools to the whole company at the same time. And so the other aspect of this is it created a sense of urgency. And that urgency created like this critical mass of attention and effort and energy. And it ratcheted up the state of the art and our tools and our techniques and the entire culture change mission would just be up on a new plateau after that. But did not happen overnight. Success was very far from certain for most of the five years that we spent on this problem. And remember, we had to just gradually increase the knowledge, gradually get the tools better in order to provide people with the experience of testing because data was not going to help us. I mean, yeah, we told the GWIST story over and over and over again. And, you know, it was just really easy for teams to be like, wow, that's so cool. I love hearing about how GWIST did it. And that's great. But, you know, my project, we've got, like, these other things that keep us from doing it. And so, you know, it's just different. Wish we could. But we're not going to focus on that. We're not going to focus on the negative today. Uh, I, you know, get me a beer later and we'll talk. But... Uh, Let's take the pieces that I showed you of this testing grouplet puzzle, see how they fit into the bridge across the chasm. I can't take credit for this model. That goes to Albert Wong. He's another ex-Googler who's now at the VA Digital Service. And he had actually one of his earlier engagements was with United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. And he did a tech talk on his experience about what they did. And he had this great model. And I said, you know, hey, Albert, can I steal your slide? He said, sure. I'm like, but I'm going to give it a weird name, though, because <laughs> he called it Framework for, help for Helping, and I thought uh, it needs to stick in people's brain more than that. So welcome to the rainbow of death. But what it does here is it kind of outlines, I don't know if you can read the red one very well, it says intervene. Um, it outlines all the functions necessary to carry that initiative from one side of the chasm to the other in terms of the needs of that early majority. And the progression is also linear. So over on the left, you need the, the experts there doing the work hands-on, but eventually you progress to the point where the early majority has the knowledge and the power to do the right thing. So bear in mind, when I fill these in, like certainly each of these things could spread across multiple buckets, but it would get pretty crazy if I did that. So let's just go with one at a time. The mercenaries and the tools teams, well, that's not showing up. Test mercenaries, tool development with the tools teams. Um, these were the hands-on experts, the ones that were like the deepest in the trenches trying to solve problems and make things better. Test certified did a great deal to inform and inspire and mentor people, but the validation was perhaps one of its most important functions. Had all our information channels, testing on the toilet, the tech talks, the lectures, the labs, uh, the fix-its were very inspirational and high energy, and we would give out when people join Test certif Certified, they would get a build orb from us, and they'd sit in their cube so that everybody can see when the build was, was, uh, was passing, the orb was green and happy. And when it wasn't passing, it was red and sad. Uh, people kind of anthropomorphized it a bit. It's funny. And in New York, we built ones that had, like, the Statue of Liberty, and her torch was the orb. It was pretty neat. Um, Obviously, the testing grouplet and the broader test certified mentor community, we mentored. Down here, the last big steps, these two big fixits. This revolution fix it was in January 2008. That's when we rolled out the tool chain that took care of the I don't have time to test excuse. Um, because everything suddenly could build more quickly. All you had to do was declare your dependencies correct and your header files in C++, yada, yada. And you could use these shiny new tools that just shave literally hours off of build time sometimes. But it also meant, hey, now you can do more testing. And then in March 2010, we rolled out the test automation platform during the tap fix it. 
And this is still in use today. It's the centralized continuous integration service. And at the time, they've had to throttle it somewhat since then, and you'll see why momentarily. But at the time, it could test every change as it went in, figure out the dependency graph, run all but only those tests that were affected by the change. And it was so clear and precise and fast that as a build cop, after tap was everywhere, um, I would see my, my build is broken. I'd go investigate through tap, and I'd see that a dozen other people had already identified it, and it, the change was either already fixed or rolled back. And then I looked up again, the bill was passing again. And that's some incredible power. So to put some numbers on it, Rachel Potman from the tools team gave a talk at the At Scale conference last year. So these numbers are a year old, and I'm not going to belabor them. You can see for yourself. That's a lot of code, a lot of changes. And in her talk, she talks about a whole ecosystem of tools that contribute to this environment, but she makes a point of saying specifically, TAP is our automated test infrastructure without which this model would completely fall apart. Now, there's obviously plenty of room for improvement. But instead of arguing whether or not people should test anymore, which is what we were up against, they're just arguing about how best to do it. The fear is of changing things is largely gone. And Googlers today, they can you know, see tangible progress towards exciting new features instead of being held back by chronic outbreaks of high priority bugs. And you know, from the outside view, things just not only continue to work, but they keep getting better. Largely because the developers can innovate, experiment, and implement things without the fear that they're going to break something else. Even after the 2008 financial crisis, and I spell it funny for an old theater reason, um, we uh, lost most of our manual testers. But there was no quality crisis that followed somehow we had kind of reached a tipping point where people knew enough about testing and how to do it, and they had the tools. And certainly, automated testing wasn't the only reason that Google survived the financial crisis, but I'm fairly well convinced it played a huge part. So after years of grassroots teamwork, our little team done the impossible, and that made us mighty. Now, thank you. I'm waiting for somebody to get that reference. So uh, this is Caravaggio's David and Goliath, and I love putting it up here at this point to make, to make an observation. This is a self-portrait of the artist as Goliath. And the reason I put this up here is because, you know, there were no outside obstacles resisting us. The technical problems were the pretty easy ones to solve. The, the real problem was our own identity and culture. And it took a gradual, years-long effort to overcome this self-image and to appreciate what automated testing could do for us. And we had to provide that knowledge and that power necessary to change people's perceptions and experiences, because often the greatest obstacle to the changes we want to make in the world is the way that we as individuals or teams or organizations already see it. Now, I want to take another abstract side path here, how do we know still that automated testing provides value? We still can't really have, we don't have definitive metrics that people can clearly agree upon up front. Like, it, we, we talk about stories, we talk about experiences, side effects, and things like that. But realistically, how can we be certain that anything we do ahead of time is going to provide value? How do we know that a feature is going to work or not? So it's almost impossible to demonstrate the value of a preventative measure or a supportive measure, whether it's testing or security review or even documentation. And a book just came out by the CIO of Citizenship and Immigration Services, a fellow named Mark Schwartz. He's a very, very forward-thinking CIO in the federal community. Um, and he wrote this book called The Art of Business Value, and first off, he talks about why the standard measures that, that the Agile literature talks about in terms of uh, uh, demonstrating business value, they're not any good. Um, 
they talk a lot about ROI, but ROI is focused on factors that have nothing to do with kind of the incidentals that come up during development. And, <clears throat> excuse me, instead what Mark wants to replace ROI with is the proposition that value is actually this emergent property that arises from the experience of a team trying to deliver value. And to provide context for his definition, he talks about how organizations should see themselves as complex adaptive systems that self-organize under leadership's influence. So in contrast to hierarchical command and control, you know, do what you're told systems that resist change. And before you know, going any further, just really quickly hit on the basics of systems thinking here. Um, there's an author, Donella Meadows, she has an introductory book, Thinking and Systems, and she talks about how systems are comprised of elements, or in our case, people, interconnections, or relationships, and then the purpose of a system, and that the, the system's behavior depends on that structure, that systemic structure itself. You take an identical stimulus, apply it to two different systems, you get two different outcomes. And this behavior is sensitive to information flow, which is itself sensitive to the interconnections between elements, or more tangibly, to the relationships between people. And that the purpose of the system is another key factor that changes the behavior of the whole thing. The punchline, for me being, anytime you try to devise a system that tries to shape how people behave without accounting for their nature, it's gonna fail. Because in my experience, the secret to Google's success wasn't that it had you know, the smartest people or the most money or the best products or the best cafes and micro kitchens and ski trips and you know, that stuff uh, that we had. Um, the key was that it created a system that works with the best tendencies of human nature instead of against them. But that system also worked against those human factors that tend to compromise quality and innovation in the long term. The purpose of the system was continued innovation based on the principle that smart, creative people will thrive in an environment that empowers them to do so. But this empowerment depends upon the responsibility of every individual to foster constant knowledge sharing, learning, and improvement. In short, Google understood early on that innovation and success is an emergent property of a properly established system. And that brings me to the federal government. So, you know, the momentum of the healthcare.gov recovery created this political will. We're gonna start innovating across all these agencies. Specifically, we're gonna move away from these overly restrictive, catastrophically flawed waterfall style contracts. And we're gonna do, we're gonna do DevOps. We're gonna do these, you know, agile methodologies that are accepted throughout most of industry. But if innovation is something government innovation government is something people say they want, then why didn't it happen before October 2013? Very quickly, let's look at the obstacles to innovation as I see them through the lens I looked at Google's problems. So, I'm not gonna belabor any of these. Obviously, the context is different, the manifestations are different. But those same basic forces of human nature are parallel to those that we faced at Google and to those that are really frankly present in almost any organization. I mean, in the government case, people are afraid of taking risks. They don't wanna be held accountable, which is sort of government speak for getting fired. And so, you know, the desire here is to replace this, you know, culture of fear with one of shared, uh, shared effort, shared success. And I think knowledge sharing is a critical component of this so that you can eventually make the right things easy for people in the government. And to illustrate again why I have this deeply held conviction, let's take a look at my first day at Google. I thought, you know, I had the world at my fingertips. I pretty much did. I mean, I, I tell people it was like jumping into the fire to drink from the hose. But my first day in government, eh, not so much. 
I had to do a lot of digging around, bothering, interrupting people, chasing people down, going from this document to that, whatever. And <clears throat> that didn't just use up my time and energy, but all the people that I had to interrupt on my journey to find out what I needed to do to start doing something. And I realized at some point, everything the testing grouplet did, we did based on a foundation of you know, values and you know, technology, this whole combined platform, this system that existed before I joined. We needed a similar foundation in government, but it didn't exist yet. So what I do? Well, apparently, I got the term for it later without realizing it. I was trying to create a learning organization. And so there's another book I've only begun reading uh, called uh, The Fifth Discipline by Peter Singe. And he kind of outlines in the introduction like the five big things you need to have a learning organization. Quickly, he talks about personal mastery, shared vision, mental models, dialogue, and systems thinking. So this whole systemic idea is coming up again. And so everything he said in the intro resonated with me, especially this quote. I have met many people who have experienced this sort of profound teamwork in sports or in the performing arts or in business. Many say that they've spent much of their life looking for that experience again. What they experienced was a learning organization. The team that became great didn't start off great. It learned how to produce extraordinary results. So without even being consciously aware of this, I did very consciously start trying to rip off you know, some of the best ideas from Google and implement them in this new context to suit the new environment. One of the first things I did, I created this prototype that I called the hub. And you know, it was just kind of this amalgam of documentation and you know, employee directory and things like that. Um, and the idea was to try and just give people access to this information. Like, what do I need to know? Who knows it? Who's working on what? What, do they, what are their skills? And uh, eventually, this kind of morphed into what's now handbook.18f.gov, which you can actually visit. Um, they finally opened it up. And from that, we also extracted the team API, because there was a lot of data munging going on. It's like, why not expose it as JSON endpoints? <laughs> So now we have this graph of things that people can put whatever sort of interface they want. And a lot of that data eventually started coming from these metadata files we would put in our repos. Just a little YAML file that says what the project is, who it's for, the impact, who works on it, the technologies, that sort of thing, feeds into the API. And then, uh, if anybody saw Heidi's little lightning talk from yesterday, she mentioned at one point, hey, how do you capture knowledge in Slack? What you ought to do is put you know, designate an emoji like a tree and, you know, somebody will come back, you know, somebody says, that's important, put a tree on it. And um, somebody will come and triage that, make sure it gets, that knowledge is shared in the right place. So we started doing that, but then the people who were triaging were like, yeah, it'd be great if it would automatically file issues against the handbook. And the temptation was too great, so I ended up writing this Hubot plugin. And this is the first successful actual integration of this where I posted a little test message, I put a tree on it, you can see Hubot created the GitHub issue automatically and then it was the bot that put the check mark, which is another little signal, hey, don't create a new issue for this. And then somebody else was like, yay, and put a ta-da. So what this does is this radically reduces the friction necessary to capture knowledge, produce documentation, especially for our non-technical users. And by scaling up these systems, making them more accessible to team members, I was trying to create the space where these insta instigators could discover one another and connect and band together to create grouplets. <laughs> um, of course, in our parlance, we didn't use this term as much. I try to promote it, but they're like, oh, we're working groups, we're guilds, same thing. I organized and co-organized three. The first one I started was documentation to promote the hub and some of the other tools we'll see. Well, yeah, no, that's right. And um, then I started a testing grouplet, and then I, you know, started uh, the working group working group to try and, you know, create a space where people who wanted to do this stuff, you know, could share ideas, commiserate, whatever. And to make it easier for people to document their knowledge and share it with the organization, as well as with the public, I launched this little GitHub pages ripoff, we called it pages, 
we were told in no uncertain terms that it was no longer acceptable to put canonical government content on a particular domain. And so this ran on our own infrastructure with the .gov, HTTPS, and all that. Um, and then, you know, we also had this common format, figured out a way to package it, make it easy. I wrote this guides template, which was a guide that told you how to fork it and to hack on it till you had your own guide. And then you can see this is, a, you know, this isn't even all the guides now. I mean, they just kind of exploded. All these different working groups, we had, you know, an accessibility guild, agile guild, of course, testing grouplet did the testing ones. And these artifacts would not only create discussion and, you know, some sort of tangible work that people could produce within the team, but other government teams would take notice and start to contribute, and even the public. We had a couple of public contributions. And so this is like the dream come true, like, you know, a participating citizenry and all that kind of stuff. So just quickly, let's just see, I'm not even gonna belabor this one. This is just gonna filter in a bunch of the stuff I talked about, a bunch of stuff I didn't. But the point is, the same model kind of helps us see that even though it looks like, oh, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff all over the place, this whole scattered array of initiatives actually serves to reinforce one another to achieve the mission. And the point of developing the tools in particular is that all of these things map to the same principles that I believe made Google a great place to work and consequently a great force for good in our industry and society. And if I seem to be a little too critical of, of government in particular, I want to remind everyone that the bulk of the industry was about 30 or 40 years behind the curve. Um, if anybody remembers Fred Brooks from the IBM System 360 project, he had this little book in the 70s, The Mythical Man Month. He talked about how you can't add people to a late project. It makes it later because suddenly you have so much more communication complexity and overhead. And he argued for, you know, careful thought put into design, which in his day was data structures, not CSS or anything. Um, because good design often trumps the need for complex algorithms. Then he followed that up in 1986 with the No Silver Bullet essay. He talked about the difference between accidental complexity, problems of complexity you can solve with better editors, although evolution stopped at Vim, we all know that. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and better languages, for example. But then he talked about essential complexities that you can't get around, that you have to manage using this list of methods he talks about, which are based on ongoing analysis and communication. He talks about building over buying when it makes sense, or buying over building, I should say. Rapid prototyping and iteration, growing software organically, adding features as users gain experience, and cultivating great designers in particular. And the thing is, mainstream practice is still trying to catch up to his insights from 30 and 40 years ago. So why is it so hard for a good idea to get traction? Well, I found this really interesting uh, article. It's freely available online from the Harvard Business Review. It's called Why Employees Stay by Vincent Flowers and Charles Hughes. And their research wasn't into the typical why are you leaving a company, the whole exit interview. He wanted to know why employees, or they, wanted to know why employees were staying. And they have all kinds of really amazing insights that I'm just going to hit on a couple here. But he noted that managers assume that what's right for them is naturally going to be right for the employees without actually considering what might be right for the employees. So that's a common trap, and it resonates with my own experience where, you know, even new organizations, they tend to backslide into command and control structures because founders and executives and managers, most of the time, they don't really have the experience of working in a high-functioning learning organization. And as a result, many management teams, they, re they tend to remain focused on short-term goals, particularly financial goals. There's, they'll start believing in their own importance, especially if there's all sorts of you know, shallow and undeserved media attention um, are surrounding them. And they neglect to cultivate the creativity and aspirations of their employees, instead just you know, treating them like servants there to do as they're told for the cold comfort of receiving a regular paycheck. 
And in their conclusion, they note that, <clears throat> and I quote, most organizations historically have been and still are created and perpetuated by manipulative and conformist philosophies. If management wants employees to stay for reasons that are right for the individual, the corporation, and the society, it must develop existentially managed organizations that truly accept and respect people with differing values. And this article came out a month before I did. This statement, however, maybe it should sound familiar, should have deep echoes of an ideal system with which we should pretty much all be familiar based on a philosophy that was drilled into us at a very early age. Imagine your lives without the US federal government and what it's produced in terms of liberty, security, innovation, prosperity. The system the founders created, it was based on service to the people, not the system itself, and it provided the foundation for this sustained innovation and success. And it so happens our own industry has developed a rather uh, extreme version of this culture uh, beyond anything that Washington or Jefferson or Madison might have imagined. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Eric Raymond's Cathedral and Bazaar paper where he dissected the dynamics of the Linux kernel development community and then also experimented with his own fetch mail project. And he came up with a number of different principles that drive open source culture. But I was really struck towards the end, he included a quote from a Russian anarchist named Pyotr Alexevich Kropotkin. I apologize to any of our Russian friends. Uh, he had written a book called Memoirs of a Revolutionist in which he said, I began to appreciate the difference between acting on the principle of command and discipline and acting on the principle of common understanding. The former works admirably in a military parade, but it's worth nothing where real life is concerned. The aim can be achieved only through the severe effort of many converging wills. Now, it seems kind of weird to quote a Russian anarchist after extolling the virtues of American republicanism, but I think the spirit is largely similar. The founders and Kropotkin, they understood the great accomplishments are often the product of liberated individuals acting in concert. And while Kropotkin thought anarchy was the way to that path or the best path to that end, I think the American experiment has proven more scalable, scalable durable, and resilient because it provides a framework that values and pro protects individual rights and liberty rather than sacrificing them. And the system can be amended over time. They understood that continued innovation is an emergent property of a properly established system. And citizens have been free to experiment with crossing chasm after chasm ever since. As we saw yesterday, crossing, literally crossing chasms on other planets. That America got this part right really early on, I mean, it's celebrated all the time. But the tragedy of this is that we often think this system of government was just, you know, immediately handed down as a blessing from these immaculate geniuses. The true story of its painstaking development, I have been reading a lot of history lately, um, it, it was so horrible and the chances, it was about to fall apart pretty much from the outset of the revolution until about the War of 1812. This struggle would speak very loudly to those of us who are trying to produce change in any organization. And to kind of top this all off, we often talk about DevOps. We promote the promise and the practice of DevOps. It's supposed to affect organizational greatness by promoting transparency, autonomy, collaboration, all these other benefits. But I want everyone here, I challenge you to think about your assumptions of this DevOps model and what the real intent is. I mean, yes, it's a powerful, or powerful model for producing business value and achieving business objectives. But at its essence, it is a toolkit for producing complex adaptive systems designed to shape human behavior. And at their best, these practices cultivate teamwork due to the convergence, not the coercion of wills. And when that happens, you got an organization of the people, by the people, and for the people. 
that will produce insights, methods, products, services that will bridge the chasm and not only satisfy the expectations of customers and society at large, but actually exceed them. Thank you so much. So uh, we do have a few minutes for questions, I believe. And if you have a question, please walk up to the microphone. Otherwise, it won't, uh, they won't be able to hear it on the recording. What? Yeah. <laughs> the sound guys are very appreciative of the fact that I emphasize that. Oh. <laughs> we have a brave soul. So I'm curious, when you uh, work on the, the culture of testing, um, a lot of organizations have gone to uh, you know, a single engineering role rather than separate testers and, and developers. And on the one hand, I love that because you know, every developer should, on the one hand, I love that because every developer should test. And on the other hand, um, my wife, I spent a lot of time testing, and I always found it fascinating how delighted she was when she broke something, which is, I think, a, a skill that most developers are, are, are missing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, uh, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that in terms of like getting excitement about, hey, this great test, and I broke something uh, as part of the culture. Well, I mean, that's what we were driving towards. It's a much different experience when you get that feedback after a few milliseconds than after five minutes. Um, so that was kind of a big thing. Uh, and also, like I said, uh, people didn't know where to start in a lot of cases. Like, okay, we want to do testing now, so what do we do? And that's where test certified and things like that came in. And in particular with uh, manual testers, um, it turned out um, our, what was then called test engineering force, which was the, the test engineers who are more manual and the uh, software engineers in test who are focused, you know, they're full developers, but they're focused on testing tools and issues, um, managed to get them excited about test certified because they were wondering, like, what do we have to do to connect with our client teams? You know, they were kind of matrixed out at the time. And, you know, how can we have a conversation that's meaningful and productive? And so I started hammering them. I said, test certified, man. You bring test certified to them, and you say, look, just start doing these things, and you'll catch so many things up front, and then we, our time is better used. We can do some, you know, provide some higher value add here because we're not just chasing down stupid crashes or off by ones or any of that kind of stuff. And eventually, that, that really lit, you know, that spread like wildfire throughout test engineering, and then with that kind of fan out between that and all the other things we were doing, we, we managed to saturate the culture to the point where uh, it just became what you did. But it took five years. Awesome talk, I really appreciated it, thank you. Um, I noted how in the Google example, it seemed to me like this is more of a kind of like a peer-led relationship bridge building, and at 18F, you were, it seemed to me more of kind of like a leadership-led uh, culture change. I'm curious about how that modified your actions and behavior. <laughs> um, talk to me later. I, I would say it was, well, no, talk to me later. <clears throat> I, I, I will kind of say this in the abstract. Um, like I said, I left in March. You've seen my, my principles and MO. Like, I can help you through the math for later. Hi. Hi. Um, oh, you can pull that down a little, I think. Thanks. Uh, I noticed in your Google example, you talked about this 20% time principle. I was curious uh, if you have any recommendations. What do you do in a culture that doesn't have 20% that expects 100% billable time all the time? Well, um, <laughs> <clears throat> part of me wants to say, talk to me later. Um, yeah, so I think at that point it becomes a very personal decision. Either you take a risk and try to find other crazy people to fight the power, as it were, or you make a decision to leave. Um, there's, I'm sure, all sorts of various, you know, uh, points along that spectrum where you can make different decisions in context. Um, but I do think at some point, if the 
fundamental structure isn't there to eventually accept and support the kind of change that you want to create, that there's no point in spending the best years of your life banging your head against a wall. But if you can find even just one other crazy person and just do stuff, you know, kind of a skunk works, go for it, it's fun. Okay, the timer's running out. I'm not sure if we, should we cut off the questions here? Can we, any more? Uh, didn't mean to intimidate anybody. Yes, if anybody comes up and asks a question right now, it's no longer me holding people from lunch, it's you. You sure? All right, well, thank you so much.